Welcome to the Retail Smarts Podcast with Dominic Lamb. This is your guest host, Bob Schwartz. Welcome back to our first episode of season two of our Retail Smarts Podcast. Today, I'm incredibly excited to welcome Bob Schwartz to our podcast. Um, Bob has had an incredible career throughout retail and is probably in our circles most known for his involvement with Nordstrom.com. But of course, I'll let Bob tell you all about himself. So thank you so much for joining us today. Dominic, it is a pleasure to hang out with you today. I, I, um, I'm looking forward to chatting. We'll just see where the river takes us. I haven't seen you in person now for a couple of years. Obviously, there's been this pandemic happening around the world. But aside from that, um, I'm not sure that you've made it back to Australia since uh, Retail Global on the Gold Coast. I have not. You know what? I I was there for Retail Global. Uh, I had a lot of fun there, as I always do, and uh, met a lot of great people. And then came back. And uh, the good thing is, since then, and we can talk about it later, I've... um, I got involved with another Australian company and uh, I'm kind of chomping at the bit to get myself back to Oz, but you know, it's not so easy right now, but I can't wait. Well, we, we're certainly very excited to get you back. And I think that now our international borders are finally open. It should be easier for you to return. But one of the things, I guess, from my first meeting with you that I took away and funnily enough, whilst people won't see the video of this. I carry this card around with me oh, still in my wallet. And this is a card that Bob handed out at this conference that everybody took away. And basically it said, be extraordinary, hard work, not much glory. There must be some beauty which ordinary men can't see, but extraordinary men do. Extend yourself. And I think that's really stuck with me, not just because, you know, that's something that I try and do in, in kind of every facet of my life is always kind of extending your capabilities. But it's something that I've observed when you look at your career. I'm really interested to know, how did you find yourself in this kind of world of retail? So, tell me about that. Yeah. Wow. There's a lot in that, Dom. Way to hit me right over the head with it. You know what? I, I brought out here sparkling water. I've got a cup of coffee. And I've got a bottle of whiskey, and it's, <laughs> I wasn't sure which way this conversation is going to go, but I think that I think we're going towards the whiskey on that one. <laughs> well, I wish I had a whiskey. I'd join you. It's your morning. It's my night. It's easier for me. Um, you know, there's a lot there, and uh, uh, I can talk about that quote um, a little bit. Uh, first and foremost, I carry that. Here's that card I carry. Also, I've got this one that I produce, and I've got the original one in my pocket. Extend yourself is a uh, saying that was really important to my best friend, Blake Nordstrom. And uh, we were best buddies for 45 years. Blake was CEO of Nordstrom Inc. And uh, he's a peer of mine. Uh, I grew up with him when they just had, you know, a couple stores. And uh, in fact, when they came to me, I had just sold a company at Amazon when it was really his father and another uh, interim CEO uh, came in, came to me and said, Hey, uh, it was that generation that came to me and said, Hey, we're, we want to launch, build, and basically spin off Nordstrom.com. Would you do it? One of my big hesitations was uh, number one, I didn't want to work for a big company, but the whole arc sounded really interesting to me to spin it off. And uh, it was a fixed amount of time, which was interesting. And one of the big, biggest reasons is I didn't want. I didn't make, want to mix family and business, which Blake was like, you know, my brother. Anyway, extend yourself is a big part of how he approached life. You know, the Nordstrom DNA of customer first, customer centric, customers at the top, etc. And extend yourself is a manifestation of that that Blake did. Mm-hmm. Extend yourself to your customer, to your employees, to your team, to your wife, your son, everything, you know, everything you do in life, go that extra step and put your hand out and extend yourself. And it's deep within my DNA. The Be Extraordinary is a quote I brought uh, forward at his, his life celebration when I was speaking. He and I rode, rode a crew. You know, we were on the crew team at University of Washington together. And uh, one of the Epic Crew Coach talked about hard work and not much glory. Uh, There must be some beauty uh, which ordinary man can't see. 
what extraordinary men do. And it just speaks to the art of rowing, which is, it's a lot of freaking hard work. Why are you doing it? Well, something's driving you inside. Yeah. And Blake and I kind of, and it, you know, little Blake and I, it, it was kind of both in our core values of hard work didn't scare us. We just like ah, rolling up our sleeves and getting stuff done. And so it, that is a, a big part of it. And part of that goes back to this thing that you asked, being a merchant. So I, I, I look at people a lot of times, and I know it's core to retail, this word merchant. I look at it kind of at its, at its root soul, which is I talk about people being great merchants. If I could hand you just a random six things and go, go make a business out of it. I think the people that are able to look at that and go, all right, I'll figure it out. Whether they just go sell those things and make money and then start the flywheel that way or whether or not they, you know, it, it's direct part of the merchant, they figure stuff out with what they're given, you know, mm-hmm. and they put their shoulder against the wheel and just get stuff done. To me, that's kind of this merchant mindset. I'll figure out how to market and sell and how to drive my business. And, you know, for me, I graduated university and, in uh, economics and went into Wall Street and thought that was neat. I always wanted to do Wall Street and got there and found out making money for money, buy money, all about money was just like, ew, it just wasn't for me. And uh, But I love the smart people there. And ultimately, it, where it led me to was helping build a company. And we were growing so fast. And this is in the... Again, I have to age myself here. This was in the late 80s. And I, um, I saw t- we were growing so fast, I had to figure something out to, to harness what we were doing. And I found this thing called technology. Microsoft, I was in Seattle, Microsoft was there. And we started to build some really interesting technology to allow us to scale the way we were scaling. I'm like, these technology people, they are smart like Wall Street people, but they actually make things. I'm going to go do that. And that led me to helping a friend of mine that had a startup that was bumping along. We sold to Packard Bell Computers. It was actually a friendly buyout kind of thing. We did, were doing a lot of work for them and they just bought us. And that's where I kind of made the big transition into uh, what today is known as e-commerce. Um, they had a lot of excess inventory and surplus inventory. And uh, I just, they were selling it to auctioneers for pennies on the pound. I'm like, I can do something else with this. And I went to the CEO and said, let me do something else with all this stuff. Opened up a couple uh, factory outlet physical stores for Packard Bell Computers. And then I had a relationship because I learned the code. And part of that last company was a software company with Prodigy an online service. There was no internet. These were private online services. And I opened up a store there. And then the internet came. And because I had some technology coding background, I cranked together a website selling computers online early on. But again, you were transacting not online, but by calling an 800 number. And that just... I absolutely adore being a merchant. And I'll go back to that. I had... I love the idea of... At any time, I could, I could go online and and create a promotion. I could do certain things. I could come up with a value statement for products or product set that we had. And I could instantaneously see how that drove demand. And in my old business, the one we were growing quickly that we were scaling, it was we grew it in part by direct mail, of which you had to wait 30 days, see what worked, wait another 30 days, see what worked. This was instantaneous. I had a blast and knew I was hooked on this thing that ultimately became the internet that ultimately became this e-commerce thing. Let's unpack that story because it's what's really interesting to me is that you obviously really enjoy being surrounded by smart people that you can you know, riff off in, in some respects. But aside from that, there is also this drive, I think, around, you know, it's more than just making money. So the interest for you is really values driven. I'm interested to know, is it, is it the people, the people that you surround yourself with and the teams that you create and the opportunities you create that is the part that kind of keeps you coming back? Or is it... I guess, something else? Mm. I mean, I suppose that's that's the question for mm. you to answer. Well, I'll answer it a little bit through somebody else's eyes. Uh, both my boys are now men. 
And when they were in college and just post-college, one was doing amazing things with our National Football League media and actually won a, uh, won an Emmy. Wow. And I had another son who had a startup in college. And I was talking to them both about stock options and that way to look at business. And they're asking me all these questions. I'm like, guys, I have to be honest with you. I thought because of my life, which I've always looked at not jobs, but as projects, I will take something from point A to point B because I'm excited about it. I'm curious about it and I'm interested in it. And I, I think I can add value to it. It's really an interesting challenge to me. There were times I would do that. Then you have these moments in between. And I know the boys growing up, as you know, you've got kids they sense more mm. than they listen to you. They feel and they watch you. And I thought that they saw that and they thought, and I figured they're not going to like these, this start stop mode that I have, this project approach to what I did, which was really, say, three to five year journeys. And uh, I figured they were going to just get big corporate jobs. And I said that to them. I'm like, I, you guys are surprising me. I, I thought I scared you away from this. They're like, no, dad, we saw you go after things you were curious about and interested in about and passionate about. And we want to do the same thing. So mm. uh, it's kind of what I, I, I've done. I've set my life up to allow me to do that. And it's a good lesson for other people. Sometimes you just can't or you got to get there. I had to get there too. But I tried, you know, in my life, I made more money than I spent, right? I stuffed, mm. I could always had the bigger house. The f I always had one fast car. So I couldn't have had a... <laughs> Perhaps I could not have had a faster car. That was my one weakness. But it allows you to the, have freedom to make those kind of choices. If you've got a little bit of a war chest, you can look at the world that way. So for me, I chose things. I in, in like the Nordstrom thing, what I learned from that and Packard Bell and prior to that, Aetna in that old business that we were scaling big companies. And today with founders, uh, you kind of scratch test them to see what they're made of. Mm -hmm. And big corporations, I scratch test to see, do you want to play at this? Because a lot of big corporations think, oh, that's neat. I want to go do that. Let's hire some people. But they're not committed. Or do you want to win? Nordstrom had the DNA and wanted to win. They had the infrastructure, the, I mean, a, a, a culture that was built to allow me to do what was right. Um, other companies don't, and I've scratch tested them along the way and just passed. Uh, founders, it's do they understand the levers and willing to accept the levers of brand culture? Basically, and we can talk a lot about this, but basically, my success levers I see are the common statement for founders or startups. And you get a lot of a lot of medias out there. You know, here's the 10 most important things. Well, and you hear this over and over. The three most important things for a founder or a success business is execution, great execution, great execution, right? Well, of course. But to me, that's table stakes. You better do things well and you're going to screw things up. Mm. But that's not the answer. If that's all you do, you're just like everybody else. So you got to do stuff differently. And I want to find a founder that understands that or in their DNA wants to do that anyway, because that is the magic between creating, you know, another blah, blah, blah company that's out there that's just part of the noise yeah, or building something special. I look at like one of my companies I just got off a half hour ago with a board call with W Promote. It's a digital marketing agency. When I met Mike Mothner and Mike Block and Mike Stone, the three Mikes that are co-founders, they had maybe 50 people and it's a digital agency. I had a nice long chat with Mike Mothner and deep in his DNA, he knows all this stuff and he just didn't want to make big dumb mistakes. He had something special he wanted to build. And I even warned him against building an agency that big. You've got to cross this dangerous chasm and maybe you're better off just stopping at maybe 125 people. He goes, nope, we're going. We're now over a thousand people, uh, Glassdoor and uh, Ad Age and all the companies from day one gave us number one, you know, best place to work for. Uh, we still had a, a thousand people, best place to work for. A founder like that, Mike just deeply in his DNA knew. You, you, could, you could just kind of see whether they understand that and want to you know, move forward with it. Because that's the magic. Right there is the magic is a company allowing you to do that. It's Everything else is table stakes. You got to do the other things, right? And I got to tell you, it's of all the companies that I've done, including Magento, which is a whole not another story, which it was a great thing. I dove all in on that one. 
W promotes probably been the easiest one. These guys are so action oriented and just do everything so well. So there you have it. The things that stick with me about the stuff that you've said, and certainly for our listeners, right, is, you know, if you go back to the fast car, right, or you go back to the rowing, at the end of the day, it, it is about having a team that's willing to put in the hard work to get to the outcome. And it is at some degree about winning, right? It's about doing something different to get to an outcome that is a success. Um, and it seems to me that that's how you pick your involvement with people. Are they hungry? But are they, you know, rational to have enough of a plan to get to the table it, in effect? It, um, and then what are they going to do with the table? Like how many people are they going to feed? Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you're uh, you're right over the target on it. And I don't know how to define it. Uh, uh, there's kind of a circular effect that you're talking about. And uh, if I go back to, to rowing, you know, women on campus weren't chasing me around because I was a rower, right? They, they, they were chasing the football players, the basketball players, the, you know, the big stars of the, uh, of the future. I didn't have, you know, rowers don't have uh, uh, profiles that part of a team. We also don't have big paychecks where, you know, oh, someday we could be yeah. pro. Well, no. You know, it, you, you win this little tiny medal and it means the world to you, but you're there for a different reason. You're there mm. for the challenge. You're there because you just feel like you can do it. And a big part of it is freaking unbelievable hard work, mm. you know, building Magento. I fell in love with the, uh, the, the original founders, Roy and, and Yoav and what they were doing. And it just fit. I knew I could add a ton of value. And that's another thing I always look, can I add a ton of value outside value to it? And we were just great puzzle pieces, but I was in all my companies. I'm kind of the, I get to know all the janitors. I'm one of the first guys in and first guys out. Not because it's suffrage, but just, hey, it's kind of fun. And if you, you, you know, I just like the challenge of it. And you're right. Part of it, I don't like to say it's about winning, but it, I don't it like, is. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe it is. Yeah. I don't like that. I mean, certainly I didn't go through all that in rowing to try to end up losing. I did it no. because I, we were one of the best in the country and there's a couple other competitors too that I, I, every time I was working out, they were in my mind, beat them. Is it about being the best as opposed to winning? Oh. Cause I think that, I think they're two really different things. Oh. And I think that, you know, in many of your businesses, like you talk about, you know, being, you know, the, the best employer, you know, being the best or the, or the most unique or the only one, you know, which in effect is winning because it is different and you are producing quality over just mass, I guess, mass investment, which you do see a lot now, particularly with, you know, equity raising. Yep. You know what? Uh, I, I should be on the couch. You should be my therapist. Um, <laughs> best is best is a, uh, a great word for it versus winning. And to me, I'll, I'll kind of spin it around. Um, the world, the word I hang a lot of this on is building value. Mm. And when I say, you know, I, a lot of times people think value as in a value, a deal. I say value is, I play with this as a keynote. I've never done it, but I see the world as a, uh, people see building the company as uh, I need a lot of revenue or profit. To me, I see the world in a value equation. Right over on one side of the equal sign is this word building value. On the other side mm. is a myriad of things that includes pluses, but it also includes minuses. And sometimes a minus happens, or sometimes it's part of your DNA, and you've got to make sure that you understand that. But it's an equation. And what I want to do is I want to build value in this world. I I never want to build. I'm never with a company to oh geez you know that's great. We can probably end up selling it for a lot. It's, that's just not my game. And it's a little bit why I've always stayed away from pure venture. And I get involved, I get involved with, you know, the companies I, I do business with deeply because, mm -hmm. uh, it's not about the transaction. It's about just building a great company and building value. And, and I, I look at it in, in life and everything else. I, I just want to build value. And, and a part of this, I'll, I'll give Blake 
um, and his father and that whole, you know, the Nordstrom DNA part of it, you know, part of it's, I'm sure in my DNA, but part of it is just growing up with those guys. You just learn, you know, nothing's, nothing's about the short term. The Nordstrom family, when the company went public, they were one of the first companies to tell Wall Street, we're not going to report quarterlies. We're going to report quarterlies, but we're not going to give you forecasts about quarters. We're going to talk mid to long term. And I've been in a public company before, a different one I had to turn around, that was all about quarterlies. And yet you knew exactly what you needed to do right for the mid and long term to get the company healthy, Mm. but you couldn't, right? And so part of my DNA in hanging out with perhaps those people is this idea of mid to long term build value in life, build value with companies. And with companies, if you build value, like say W from O, uh, you know, we're growing, we continue to grow. Our clients love us. We're doing great things. Our culture is great. Our employees, you know, it, all, all those things, you, all your multiples are, uh, create a very valuable asset and look, somebody may come knock on your door and go, Hey, I want to write you a check. Like, you know, they did with Magento a couple of times. But that wasn't the goal. So you're right. It's it's about being, you know, best. And to me, best is creating value for in life. How do you assess whether you can add value to a venture? Because I'm sure you've gotten it wrong from time to time. You can't possibly have a hundred percent strike rate, can you? You, you? you should do this for a living. You're, you're, the podcast yeah. or the psychology? Yeah, both. <laughs> Your questions are br- brilliant. Um, I see, and I see the box of Kleenex there. If I was there live, you could just- yeah, people come in here and cry a lot. It's true. <laughs> it, yeah, it's true. And not necessarily about bad things. They just come in and tell me things. But yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. I've had an extraordinary, uh, I'll call it hit rate, um, mm. uh, in success pattern. A lot of people get opportunities that come to them, and, and some of them in my life they've come to me, but. Uh, uh, I, I also look for ones. I, 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 I filter them. And like I said, part of it is how much, where can I add value? Cause if I can't add value, uh, a lot of outside, outside value, you know, my, my structure of this portfolio approach to growing companies is, you know, the, the newest company on board or the two newest, I'm usually not just on the board and sometimes I'm vice chairman, but I'm also, you know, they get a big chunk of my life. And the the journey is, you know, three to seven to 10 years. I mean, this, this is not for the faint of heart. These are marriages. And so you really got to filter, filter, filter. And when I look for the value, it's, it's, it's kind of this Venn diagram of, you know, is it in a market, you know, is, and to me, the market is basically retail commerce technology. Does it fall somewhere in there? Um, do I, one of the things is, do I, have I been there before? Can I help them uh, move along more assuredly and prevent them and help prevent them from stepping on landmines along the way? And because how much do I know? Part of it is about credibility. Do I bring credibility to the organization that can instantly lift them to another category of client or distribution, et cetera? You know, do I marry well to the founders and the founder team? Do we get it together? So those are the things, those are some of the things I look at. You know, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, it's really like a marriage. I mean, it's like a proposal, right? We just have a dialogue and it's not a, we're not negotiating back and forth. We're just kind of trying to feel it. Do you, when you do this and when you, when you, I guess, look at the kind of next project that you're going to take on or, you know, the smallest company in your portfolio at the time, um, or, you know, if you're looking for, for a new company to bring on, do you stick to that very defined, this is the category of business that I'm looking at? Or do you look outside of that out of curiosity? Because obviously you are a, by nature a curious person. Mm-hmm. You are definitely interested in people thinking different ways and doing different things. So do you expand, I guess, the category of business that you work for? Or is it very much, you know, I know how to do this thing? And I do it well. Yeah, I think one of the, uh, there's a couple filters. So yeah, to date, and then I'll tell you kind of going forward. So to date, there's two two companies that are kind of in my active portfolio where I'm either on the board or very active with them. And they're either what I'll call early growth growth, or they are private equity stage. And I'm on the, I'm on the board of two private equity companies. I didn't grow them. 
I'm just on the board because I really like the private equity firm. They're true growth capital. You know, one's called Sundance, which is the known brand that a lot of people know uh, on it. There is a, there's a retail component to Sundance brand, Robert Edford's brand. And I'm on that board and was invited on that board by a private equity firm. Most of the private equity firms don't take outside, but but this made a lot of sense. I've known them um, for a while. Another one called Matilda Jane. And then I've got my growth, you know, kind of the growth companies that one by one, I was very active with them, then settled down to a board role. Uh, along the way, uh, and I try, I try not to do early, early. If you go too early, it's a lesson in life for maybe the people that are listening, like, ah, I want to do early stage. I'm going to, I'm going to consult to a couple of them. Early stage, I think you can win two ways. You, you know, I'm and my early is, you know, say my my sweet spot is say it's it's fifty employees or fifty talented people to two hundred and fifty is kind of the sweet spot. Below that, you're kind of starting to get into this early stage seed capital ideation. No product in the market. I need product in the market because my levers are strongest. The value I can bring, the gas I can put on are stronger if it's about brand, marketing, culture, driving things into it, scaling a company that can support that kind of growth, helping them understand it versus the ideation of wouldn't this be cool if, which is fine. It's just not where my my true strength lies. So a couple times I've been like a venture guy talked me into helping out a company and I kept saying it's too early, it's too young, et cetera. And he said, ah, you know, it'll be quick, it'll be easy. And I'm like, ah, it was and it was a mistake. It just it burned a lot, it was just a lot of my time and energy. So the two ways to do it is if you're gonna do early, go all in, be all in with a company, be part of the team, be all in, or you need a basket of twenty-five. Right. And if you're doing what I do, I can't create a basket of 25 because I'm, I'm more hand curate. I'm more involved with them. You can't do that. 25, what I'll say, a basket of 25 in three years. That you now need to move into deploying capital to do that. And you got to be a venture guy. And if you think about the venture guy and venture gal out there, they're scouting the world. They're not picking their neighbor's friend's buddy that comes to them, right? A couple of times I've been sucked down before because I, yeah, I like them. They're nice. But the two that I got caught up in and have actually, uh, they were slightly earlier and slightly outside, but it, it, it still kind of was within the circle. One was called One Hope Wine. And it was at the time, it was a, I'll call, I'll call him a kid. He was probably 27. He left a big wine distributor. It was before Tom Shoes, if you know the brand. Mm. The brand is tightly associated with doing good in the world. Um, mm-hmm. And he wanted to create a wine brand that was similar to what Tom's was starting to do. And he called it One Hope. And Jake had a big vision. And you can't say no to Jake. And he's just an amazing guy. I'm like, Jake, I don't know wine. I, he goes, come on, but you know, technology, we're on a scale. It's brand and culture. And Jake is now out of 10,000 wine brands, one of the top 100. He's mm. created a, a business model that not only is the traditional model we all know at stores and retail and bars and, and resorts, mm. but also he's got 10,000 mostly women who are, he calls them cause entrepreneurs, who represent his product around the United States for weddings and for parties and, and all kinds of things. And they're proud to do it because it creates good in the world. They, you know, they've given millions and millions and millions to charities. Uh, and the women that do this, they make a little money, but they can also donate some money. And he's just built a, a magnificent, magnificent brand. And even though I didn't know wine, and I really don't, I'm not a wine guy, I really don't care about it. He built a phenomenal brand, a phenomenal culture. He's a phenomenal CEO and founder. The other is, the other I, I I did recently is kind of same story. It was two founders. They had sold a technology company. And they're like, you know, we could either do technology again and beat our heads against the smartest people in the world, or cannabis is now getting legalized in the United States. Yeah. And they came and they were officed in some space I had. They needed some space at one of my companies. And I had extra space and the founders knew them. So we put them in there. And really, really phenomenal founders and smart, smart, two smart dudes. And they, um, and real experience. They're not the, you know, the cannabis, hey, dude, you know, 
let's do, I can, I. these guys were really good operators and had a brilliant vision to build a great brand and they called it Island. It's island.co and they built a, they were building a marvelous brand. This was early on. They kept asking, they'd hear me across the office talking to my founders and to the boards and things like that. They're like, we need you. I'm like, guys, I don't know cannabis. Mm. I didn't even try this stuff until the, like the last five years. And I still don't know what to do with this stuff. And uh, they talked me into it. And that's been, these guys are two of the best. I mean, they, they've done everything right. The only thing in the way is the federal government and you know, just the, the, the mess that's out there. It's almost like you have a board. You're playing the game perfectly. You're playing it perfectly. These guys are playing it perfectly. And then every once in a while, somebody comes up and just shakes the board on you. Yeah. I, are you kidding me? And they've done a great job. So both of those are a little bit outside the circle, but I was curious about them. I thought they were fascinating. And I almost did one early on in um, crypto. It was a marketplace. Some really serious guys that I've known from my past from the venture world were interested in it. I thought it, it fit my brand, commerce, retail, technology. But as I scratched away, um, truth be told, if, if you thought liquor, beverage, wine was funky... And cannabis is edgy. When I scraped away and went into this, the people in and around crypto, especially, what was it, eight years ago? It is wild. And I'm like, "Mm," you know, again, value, et cetera. Everybody seemed like they were after it because it was going to make them rich. And I'm like, okay, no, not not my game. I, I don't, not my game, so... Um, it's it's interesting. Obviously, you've spent lots of time with lots of kind of um, you know venture capital and all sorts of of different businesses of of that kind, and lots of investors. What would what's your advice, I guess, to to those startups that are looking to do rounds in terms of who they decide um, to sell their souls to? <laughs> How do you find someone that, in effect, reflects your values? that is prepared to back and support a business? Like, you know, how do you do that? Mm. Well, it's I'm a, sure you've got lots of interesting opinions on this one. <laughs> yeah. So if you're talking about it, there's two things, uh, two parts of this. I'll stay, I'll stay with the raising capital versus the acquisition or sale. Mm. Um, so the raising capital, because sometimes when you, you're acquired or sell, you're, 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 you're done or you're quasi done. So mm. it either goes well or it doesn't go well and whatever you got, ch- you got most of the money, you got the checks, you, you'll go figure something else out to do. It is actually a lot more serious than that. We can talk about that, but we'll go back to the raising of the capital. And it is, it's a little bit of a dance because, you know, uh, depending where you are on your arc, the type of company you are, you have a hard time saying no to capital because you're trying to find it. It's your lifeblood. Mm-hmm. I will recognize that. And in this conversation, we'll just agree that, okay, sometimes you kind of got to do what you got to do. But if you're going through the dance, uh, if you're a founder and you're looking for capital, make sure, number one, the people you're talking to that their Venn diagram fits yours. In other words, are they in your space? Are they funding companies your size? You know, the lesson you have to learn about capital venture funds is it's not the venture firm's money. They got it from somebody else that's much bigger than them, that has billions and billions of dollars. And they each handed them checks for millions, if not tens of millions or hundreds of millions and said, your commitment to us, you we're going to give you this money because you're going to do X, Y, and Z. They can't do anything else. They, they've taken that money for that mission. Uh, I'll give you a crazy example. A venture fund, if you walked into them and said, here's a $5 million company, I want you to put a million dollars into it, for sure, for sure, for sure, it will be worth 50 in three years. For sure. Right, so your one million will now be worth five million. Can't do it. Can't do it. The poker game they have to play is they've got to find companies that are going for hundred billions, basically. And we've mm-hmm. heard that over and over again. But the reason mm-hmm. is they got money from somebody else. Somebody else says you're at the very top of our risk portfolio of the risk triangle, right pyramid. You're at the very top at the highest risk. We need you swinging for the fences. I don't need you doing real estate. I don't need you doing growth stocks. 
This money in our portfolio approach is saved for the riskiest stuff. You need to swing for the fences. My poker game is I play 25 hands over three years deploying this kind of capital. And I know so many are going to die and so many are going to fly. And of those, I need a couple to hit it over. And if, if one of them I did 5 million is going to turn into 50, I've screwed up my hand. I've screwed up my poker game. I've screwed up my formula. So that's on that side. So when you, when you are an entrepreneur out there looking, you need to kind of scrape, scrape away because you'll get really disappointed because you won't understand perhaps why they said no to you. But if it wasn't a good fit, you know, the only good thing about a not a good fit, perhaps might just ask them who would be a good fit. But I think that that's, that's probably one of the most important lessons. The other part is I get asked some t- a lot of times, which I don't do, is, hey, will you help us raise? Hey, I would like you to uh, can, uh, advise us to raise capital. I'm like, okay. Uh, to me, that's not, that's an outcome. It's not an end goal. And you, and the outcome is obviously you need a good company, it needs to be, you know, whatever, whatever. But let's put that aside. There's a lot of energy that goes into having to tell your story properly um, and, and kind of telling it right. And with early founders, you know, it can be a challenge because there's so much that they want to talk about. But I would say the magic there is like any, anything you do in direct to consumer, it's a stair step. The first message you get out, all you want is them to communicate back to you. Don't overfeed them, right? Just get them curious. And each step along the way feeds them more so you can get to the next place. Kind of tell your story up front, the biggest metrics you can do, get them interested in the in the big picture. And, and if you're a venture firm, you're basically looking at, is this an interesting big enough space? Does it fit what I know and I'm interested in? But really, do I believe in these people? And, and not that they're not good people or not. And it's hard because um, it's not purely a track record that helps. But it's it's also, do I believe in these people in that um, it's going to get tough? And can they do, can they be extraordinary? Hard work and not much glory. Because for a long time, you don't, there's not a lot of glory in it. And so can they put in the hard work and, and, and can they pivot and figure it out? Because what they're telling me today, I will guarantee you, and this is an old saying, we always talk about budgets and spreadsheets of early stage companies. The one thing we know absolutely true about that, that spreadsheet and that, you know, that the five year truth is it's wrong. That's all we know is it's wrong. So it doesn't mean it's not going to, the dreams won't come true. It's just, we know it's wrong. Can you figure it out along the way? So they really, the people thing is a big, big part of it. And if you're shy on people, find some of the right people that are willing to commit to you when the funds come in and talk about those people during the process. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. So thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, and hopefully we will um, get to the US shortly and, and catch up with you. Um, we've got a few members doing some pretty incredible things uh, there at the moment. We didn't make big show this year, but we're certainly hopeful for 2023. I don't think you made it either. Did you, you go to Show this we year? did not go to the NRF big show. We at the last minute, we everybody we just pulled out. Everybody did, I yeah, think, yeah, which yeah. is a bit sad. Yeah. But we're hoping to be back. We're hoping that it'll come back. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping sometime in the next months to be back your way. And I'd love to sit down and catch up with you again. Always good. You're Absolutely. A, you're a good human in the world, and I appreciate that. Oh well, we're, we're absolutely looking forward to seeing you back in Oz anytime. But thank you so much. Have a good night. Enjoy the whiskey. Dom, it was a pleasure. I thank you. Yes, that is the one I ended up choosing. Thank you. Of the three drinks, I decided it was a whiskey event. Fantastic. All right. Well, it was lovely to see you, and we'll um, we'll chat again soon. Thank you for your time, and thank you, listeners, for all the time. 